for industry that uses as much water as we do is only just catching up. And, and then it's on brewers to try and prioritize investing in, in wastewater, good water practice, which is challenging. Enthusiasts, my name is Chris Rachkowski, your host again today for the Future Foodcast, where we talk with thought leaders in today's food industry and discuss the trends and technologies that will shape the future of food. Very happy to be speaking with Brad Goddard today, the Director of Business Development at Big Rock Brewing in the same city that I live in here in Calgary, where it's a balmy about minus 15 degrees Celsius today, and we're happy to be in so indoors doing this podcast. Good. Well, again, welcome to the program. Um, and you know, to kind of get started with learning about um, your company, Big Rock, and all the interesting things going on there, it's always helpful for our audience to learn where did Brad come from? How did Brad get into this mess that he's in now? You can tell us a bit about how you got started in this sector and what brought you up to the point where you were involved with Big Rock. Boy, I, I actually have a fairly unconventional path into beer. I wasn't a beer drinker. I was teaching theater at the University of Waterloo, and I quit that job and moved to Toronto to uh, be a stage actor with my identical twin brother. So and that is an important part of the story. I got an identical twin brother and uh, he was working at Steam Whistle Brewing at the time. And this was year one of Steam Whistle. This be back in 2000 or 2001. And he had an audition and he needed a particular set of clothing. And this is before cell phones and all that stuff. I wore his clothing down to Steam Whistle's brewery. We switched clothes on the coffee break and I went out and worked wearing his work clothes, went out as him on the production line, loading dirty beer bottles on the, into the bottle washer. He came back at lunch, we switched back, and uh, and I went out and proceeded to drink three pints, which was your staff allocation at that time. Got uh, a pretty good hat on, and we got called upstairs, and I thought, oh boy, we're going to get fired. I can't get fired. I am not employed by them. My brother can get fired. I can kind of get tossed out. Uh, unceremoniously turfed out the front door. We got called upstairs. The founders of Steam Whistle came and Greg, young guys themselves, thought it was hilarious and gave me a job. And it was only, and so then I, I literally went to work the next day as myself and fell into a career in beer. I, I wasn't a beer drinker when I started and I started drinking beer because I got a lot of free beer with my pay and, and you're surrounded in beer. And, and the only way, especially in sales, the only way to tell if the beer is fresh is to, is to drink it. Um, and, and fell into a 20-year career in beer, really unusually started by a caper. <laughs> well, that, that's a, a great entry story there. And as you noted, you, you got started with a company that I guess at the time was an early stage craft beer company. And now they're quite a large producer. Right? They're certainly distributed across Canada, very well known, very well respected and you continued on from there. I understand a bit of a journey westward for you. Oh, yeah. So, so then, in, uh, because I worked um, those salad days at Steam Whistle, there weren't very many employees, and those that were had to do a little bit of everything. And so I really started on the operations side and, and did, did some time in brewing. I got too lonesome in brewing, and so I focused more on sales and got pulled off the production floor on certain days of the week. And that exposure across the business from the, you know, the beer being born to the beer being packaged to the beer being served gave me a unique insight into the business, which meant when they needed to expand into Western Canada, I had a pretty good series of complementary skills to go out and sell the brand. I also was a bartender and a tour guide and all that stuff. So I jumped in a 68 Chef pickup and, and drove west in 2005, ostensibly for one year, which uh, has turned into whatever, maybe 15 years or so. I, I'm probably in Alberta now. I've been here long enough. And as I started having children out here in Western Canada, in Calgary, I got lonesome for seeing beer actually getting made. You know, and, and, and it was such a unique experience working at Steam Whistle, which was a pioneer of, I'll say, this modern renaissance in craft beer. But in Calgary, there is uh, one of the pioneers of the original renaissance of craft beer post-prohibition, and that's Big Rock. And they have a very large facility here. And, and they were going through uh, a leadership change and a real rethinking or some navel gazing on who they were as a brand. That change came at the same time as I started thinking, if I'm not moving west, or moving home east to have children and be close to my family, then 
my other need is I need to be near where food, where beer is being made. I have to see it. That is a Mm -hmm. need for me where I started in the business was very hands-on and I needed to have that in my life. And so I had a conversation with Big Rock and, and came over and then at Big Rock moved through sales and in through sales leadership into where I am now, which is some business development and, and policy work or advocacy. And that business development really has me working quite deeply interdepartmentally to produce beer on behalf of people from across Canada and around the world, which is Mm. awesome. It's a ton of fun. Well, um, you have pretty deep qualifications across this part of the food and beverage sector. And it's great. I always like talking, especially with people that have experience both essentially from the startup side all the way to the corporate side. And while it's not quite, you know, InBev or one of the global colossuses, and once you get to a certain point in a corporation size, it's it's corporate. Um, so that you're at a big successful company now. Um, tell us a little bit more about what's going on at Big Rock and kind of the, the mandates you're seeing there, especially as they wrap around sustainability and technology that's bringing the company forward. Big Rock's unique in that it is one of the largest craft breweries in Canada. So from an advocacy or policy standpoint, that creates its own suite of challenges. But it also means that we have to graduate into larger production scale equipment. And that is a tough jump. When you go from 32 cans a minute, which is basically the basement right now on atmospheric fillers, up into 250 cans a minute or where Big Rock, we just completed the largest capital investment in our facility since we built our current brewery in 96, we just spent eight and a half million dollars to to refit our canning line and, and add some pasteurization in. The equipment has come a long way, but boy, is it ever expensive when you when you're making that jump from startup or or kind of smaller craft brewing. There's not a ton of equipment for breweries Big Rock size, right? Big Rock is is a, is about a quarter of a million hectoliters, and apologies for using what is a relatively obscure metric measurement, but it's it's how breweries talk. A, a hectoliter is 100 liters. There's great suite of equipment, not great equipment, but a lot of choice around small scale brewing. And then there's of course tremendous choice when you're 420 million hectoliters, like somebody like ABI or Molson Coors. But for Big Rock, there's there's not a ton of choice, and so it makes that biting that off a real gut check moment, which we just did and, and put in. The big benefits are water consumption, so brewing and, and beer production, so the, the canning and bottling of beer, is a real, really thirsty operation. You know, craft beer benchmark or beer in general benchmarks between four liters for every liter of beer produced. Craft breweries will use between four liters and 10 liters uh, to produce one liter of beer. And so getting better equipment and creating efficiency there is is of tremendous value. And then managing the, we use a lot of cleaning supplies. You know, making great beer is mostly about keeping your equipment clean. More than anything, more than anything, keeping things clean is, is important. And that uses a lot of chemicals that you're loath to send down the drain. And the on-site water treatment now has finally started getting accessible for craft producers. What I'll call skid systems are essentially small systems that you can plug into your, your brewery. But prior to that, our industry, which is it's the top employer, it is a craft brewery in almost every community in Canada, certainly of a certain size, there's a craft brewery there. But wastewater management for industry that uses as much water as we do is only just catching up. And then it's on brewers to try and prioritize investing in, in wastewater, or good water practice, which is challenging. It's challenging for a brewery, big rock size, but as an industry, it's a it's a major opportunity because now technology is caught up with us, affordable, accessible technology. So clearly an important part of the business and not only from a sustainability point of view, but fact is saving waste actually improves the bottom line. Um, oh, yeah. I think a lot of manufacturing companies have learned that over the last 30 plus years. And um, this is also ends up being very important to your customers and in, in reaching out to your customers and these days, you know, although somebody's going to buy the product largely based on taste, quality, cost, sustainability has become a much more um, important decision point for a purchase. Maybe not for everyone, but for a growing portion of the consuming public, particularly, I think, maybe those that are in the craft beer consumer target area. How does that effort that Big Rock is making translated into your outreach to customers and how are they reacting to that? It's still very much a work in 
progress. You know, uh, we have we own a brand called Tree Brewing, which is was born in Kelowna and and really has that outdoor brand identity. And so we're getting ready to roll out a new brand identity that that aligns that brand and and the the act of buying tree beers directly connected with planting trees. And so it is a brand identity. It's that badge value. A lot of consumers now are buying on on brand, right? The beer, I, I, you could have the best tasting beer in the world. If you don't have a, a great brand or a compelling brand story and you don't have distribution, doesn't matter, right? You'll be, you'll be making it an echo chamber. And we find certainly craft consumers, which is about 15% of the beer consumed in Canada, let's say at a high level, about 15% of this craft beer, those consumers are, are very, very engaged in that element of craft brewing. Ironically, um, craft brewers, they, they talk a lot about environmental sustainability and, and planting trees is one of those active ways we can almost enhance the consumer experience. Instead of giving them a hat or a toque, or a coaster yeah. or something like that. We can give them a tree. We can say, hey, I'm going to go plant a tree on your behalf. And, and we have found that that is quite compelling. I mean, beer in general, you'll often see craft brewers align with charity pint programs. You know, this, this idea of micro giving, the consumer is participating in these micro donations and the brewer is, is facilitating that because it aligns not only with our brand agenda, it also aligns with the employees of craft breweries and the founders of craft breweries who are personally invested in, in those causes and making the world a better place in these little incremental steps in ways that we can have impact. Yeah, and, and this is an interesting point that I think we're starting to see cropping up in a number of different um, spaces, especially on the food and beverage entrepreneur side. You know, of course, big companies can make big splashes, but it seems like the entrepreneurs and this is true across all technology spaces. The real innovation typically comes from the entrepreneur, small, medium-sized business. And you mentioned kind of giving back and enabling customers to give back. And I can imagine somebody picking up a can and having some mechanism to do that. How do you look at enabling a customer to, to give back, whether it's to a, a not-for-profit in the community or all the way back to a producer of hops or grains or these types of things. Yeah, so actually, the two interesting ideas there. One is, and I'll start backwards because I, I, that idea of buying local and supporting local food. And in Alberta, we have the real luxury of directly buying barley. We Alberta makes a lot of bar, wheat and barley, and so we actually know the farmers that we're buying from, which is a, a rare, unique luxury. Our consumers. Here in, in some breweries, Toolshed does a great job of it. Big Rock does a, a decent job of it, trying to connect consumers with that agri-food or the agriculture tie-in. It does resonate with Alberta consumers more so than maybe a Toronto consumer who might find it a little interesting but less compelling. But it really ties into that 100-mile diet thing where we are. We've got great water here. We've got barley and wheat coming from literally 100 kilometers out the front door of our brewery. And so consumers find that message interesting. I still, it is tough to communicate ingredients to consumers. Believe it or not, there's a lot of consumers that don't really know what ingredients are in beer, despite, mm -hmm. you know, Super Bowl ads that talk about corn syrup and rice syrup and stuff like that, which is not even the ingredients we use in the craft sector. But consumers are still a little naive about exactly how beer is made, even though it is a very old drink. Now, in terms of the micro giving or, or that cause marketing, I think craft brewing does very, very well. We've got these cans of beer that we can tell a story on that consumers spend a lot of time holding. And so communicating a cause message is pretty easy because it's easy to incorporate into the packaging. It's easy to have that person's attention because they're holding a product and you can tell a story. You can attract their interest through the name of the beer. And then you can, on the side panel, tell a bit of a story. And then at in terms of that community support, not only the charity pint programs I referenced, where we just use a metric of how many pints did we sell, and that is our donation. All a consumer has to do is buy the pint. They don't. Mm. They can feel good, but they they don't have to reach in their pocket save right. to pay for the pint. But consumers, uh, the the charity and cause marketing has been a very effective. Like we we, if I were to measure uptake in terms of pint sales or packaged product sales, we do see an uptick when we align with compelling partnerships. And it's not all environmental. You know, we'll partner with folk festivals and mm -hmm. say these arts organizations, they need our support and we'll do limited edition beers to sell and not only create awareness for the for the cause, but then also um, generate some 
some revenue that turns into a donation for those causes. And that's been, that is almost as old as craft brewing itself is that type of community engagement that's really local. I think the mm-hmm. big difference between how some multinationals, because some, some, some of the multinational brewers have some really interesting, especially water programs. I can think of Stella that does a, a pretty good job. You buy a chalice and it, it makes uh, it makes sustainable water for a community somewhere. Mm-hmm. But it feels a little abstract, you know, as a consumer, because it's not in your community. Whereas craft, generally, we're improving or working within our immediate community. And that is maybe the biggest difference between how uh, larger breweries approach making positive social and environmental change and how craft breweries do is Mm -hmm. generally our consumers can see that change happening right outside their windows. Yeah. And let's take a parallel approach to, you know, some of the things that Big Rock is doing to on the sustainability side, but also how that's impacting reaching out to customers. And you talked about being able to pick up a can and and this is one of the, I think, amazing things about the craft industry. And there's so, frankly, there's a lot of artistry that goes into can. And what a person is looking at is very important. Well, the process of getting those images there is also uses resources. And sometimes it's maybe not the best use of resources. But I want to take a little side road down this path, because I know that you're doing quite some activities in this area also to improve sustainability in the, on the packaging side. Boy, howdy. You know, one of the things that keeps me awake right now and cans, and this is something that most consumers mercifully are unaware of, decorated cans, which is the cans like your Coca-Cola can. Yeah, that's a decorated can or a painted can. So that design has been painted on the can. Almost all craft brewing cans, not big rocks, but almost everybody else's, they'll use two different materials. One's a shrink sleeve and one is called a pressure sensitive label. Both of them are plastic. And yet uh, the reason our industry has to use those labels is it's very, very difficult to get minimum production runs of decorated cans. One of the big uh, North American can decorators just announced that their minimum order is 2 million cans, which is more than most craft breweries will use over their total business. And that would be for one brand. Mm -hmm. And so craft brewing, in order to create these compelling brand stories and, and get beer into cans, we've been using these plastics. What is happening is our competitors, the multinationals, they can meet all the minimums, they can get decorated cans. They have started, right or wrong, and and I'd say maybe more right, to put pressure on local municipalities and and provincially and federally to eliminate plastics and say, boy, these are problem plastics. They're creating organic contamination in the aluminum float. And really the aluminum float is what pays for most blue boxes, is the value of beer cans and pop cans. What'll happen or what keeps me awake at night is craft brewers don't have an alternative to using plastic labels and environmental sustainability policy will run faster than technology will allow us to make these small production runs for decorated cans. It is critical to our business that, that we're able to get beer in cans. That is the, consu- the consumer's preferred format. Way more than keg, way, way more than bottle. Bottles keep going down mm. you know, almost by an order of magnitude every year. It's unbelievable how quickly bottles have, have fallen. And that can, why I say, you know, more right than wrong is plastic does, we need to work on our plastic consumption and plastic when it goes into the, into the value stream, particularly if it's going to contaminate the aluminum float, which is what, how municipalities make money to support other recycling endeavors. But industry, we're going to struggle to keep up with how fast Mm -hmm. I believe policy change will come. It's changed in Quebec. And in part of it is and this is where, I, and I'm not wearing tinfoil on my head. This is a conspiracy theory. I know that multinationals are are pushing this agenda. And I say, hey, great. Everybody hates plastics. Let's get rid of them. And then I say, wait a minute. Oh my God. I'm not going to be able to get my product to market if we're successful at eliminating plastics because I only, I have to use plastics. Mm-hmm. I think that is truthfully the number one challenge in, in the pandemic, which really pushed a lot of craft breweries to emphasize getting into cans. I think we saw a larger adoption into cans over COVID than any other kind of consumer event. It it accelerated preference for cans, but it means it also accelerated the use of these plastics, which Mm -hmm. put it on the radar, which is going to accelerate how quickly government and municipalities want to respond to it. And we as an industry, I know we can't move fast enough to, to, to keep our beer in cans. And if we're not in cans, our craft brewers will will die, right? We just, we will, we will struggle to get to market. It is, 
that era of people going to a local brewery and buying a growler, well, it's still there. It's not how breweries are keeping the lights on. How they're keeping the lights on is is distribution. Cans. Yeah. cans, distribution, getting reaching a, a wider audience than simply the people who come to them. Yeah. So boy, it it keeps me awake. That is a, a grave concern of mine. Now, Big Rock, we use very little of those, but I'm on the Alberta Small Brewing Association. I'm a, on the board of directors there. I'm the chair of the policy committee. And we're very concerned. And, and that's where Big Rock, our size, um, we can use our size, even though it doesn't directly impact us, we can use our size to create some focus and try to push some change and protect our peers mm-hmm. who haven't had the opportunity. I mean, Big Rock grew up in the era of the glass bottle with the paper label. And mm-hmm. We dealt with the labels because we washed the bottles. And so we've right. always had that kind of closed system. The bottles got returned to us. We cleaned them. We had an opportunity to grow up in a, in a very different distribution network with a very different package that in some ways is a little bit more sustainable. I think cans yeah. are actually better when you look at everything rolled into one. I think cans are actually quite a good transition for as a packaging material. You know, a bottle doesn't necessarily make a bottle. It gets ground up and put in highway paint or insulation or something like that. Like post-consumer glasses, not great, but post-consumer aluminum, fantastic. You can turn a can into a can. That's great. So the industry is moving in the right direction, but technology is not probably scaling to to meet craft's needs. Yeah. Well, and it's it's an interesting use of the uh, sustainable development efforts out there and anything can be weaponized. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Anything can and often is. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I think there's the opposite side of this. And I the craft industry also drove innovation in cans and that, you know, a couple decades ago, yeah, forget it. If you're a craft brewery, you're not going into a can, whether it's two or three decades ago as a small company, because, well, you can't do it. Whereas today, you can literally buy a canning line for, I don't know, $100,000 and get your product in cans. And I can imagine the same thing happening on the labeling side. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think it maybe connects back together and that labeling is obviously very, very important from the marketing perspective, because this is where the customer engages. And so this technology and entrepreneurs will plug this gap also. Somebody's going to make money on this regulation coming out and serving the craft industry. But it's it's increasingly important because of that story that needs to be told there. And like you said, there's quite a lot of storytelling that can be done on the can itself. But that can as a gateway to sort of the digital realm also is very, very powerful in allowing somebody, because frankly, probably just about everybody buying a craft beer in North America almost certainly has a smartphone. Mm-hmm. Um, and are you looking at how kind of the combination of a person's smart device um, interacting with your can is going to be able to understand much more than just what's on the can, but be whether it's social media clips, content information from the original producers of hops, for example, what do you see as in the future for, for your company in this situation? Yeah, and, and that's where QR codes have been around for a while. And our first uses for them were to, to show hops being harvested or or show a beer being made. So we do these limited edition beers. We made a Stein lager, for example, which is a beer that is boiled by using hot granite rocks that you dip into the brew kettle. So there's no other source. And so we did a video on that and, and consumers would, would watch it. And, and that was fine. Where it has pivoted, at least for us, and I think where it's gone for, for others, is we have a brand called Hophead. And instead of focusing on telling these really pedantic stories about this is how the beer was made, or these are how the hops were harvested, we're saying consumers want an experience with their drink. And an experience is not is pretty passive when you're watching somebody else brew a beer and somebody else harvest hops. With Hophead, we've got these QR codes, and it triggers, you hold your phone up to it, and it starts playing music. And music that we've curated for that particular style of beer. And mm. so it is less literal and it is less educational. It's focusing on your experience, the types of consumers we think that are going to be having this. They'll like this music. We can curate local artists, put it on the can, and enhance a drinking experience without saying, look at me, look at me. You know, watch my story. Take two minutes and watch us make this beer. We're saying you engage, connect with who you're having your beer with, and let us elevate that experience with some great music. And, and I, I quite like that you know i i think brewers when we first started using qr codes it was quite novel but we were being really selfish we were trying to command a lot of that consumer's attention 
And really consumers, when they're drinking their beer, they want to be, it should be more effortless. They should be able to engage and enjoy the company they're with or just unwind and relax mm -hmm. and forcing them to, to listen to yet another brand message, which is how we started using QR codes, really was getting in the way of that consumer experience. It should be all about the consumer and not just an extension of more about me, the brewer. I love that. I, I think we'll see more of it. And, and certainly with our brand Hophead, I think we, we're doing exactly what, how we should be speaking to consumers is elevating their experiences. Mm -hmm. just, and uh, it sounds, well, you're continuing with this process. So it sounds that, and you're also zeroing in on what consumers, how they want to interact, how they enjoy interacting. So it would seem you have an informed view that, yeah, this is something that certainly your company is continuing, but others may continue and that it's a legitimate way of engaging people's and ultimately so that they come back again and enjoy the next time as well. Is that yeah. And, and people I think are getting, especially trying to invade their lives with more commercials with, you know, focusing on experience is, is going to be how we win because mm. forcing, forcing more ad advertainment in there is yeah. you know, I, for me where I watch, you know, five second bumps at the start of YouTube and, and suffer through it. I've almost become immune to this constant source of pitch, 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 pitch. And that's craft is where, where craft is best is when we're fitting into people's lives effortlessly. Right. And I love that. Like, I think there's uh, across all platforms, even in terms of inside the carton, right? How do you enhance that experience so that it is for the consumer only, right? Mm -hmm. There's no agenda by the manufacturer, by the brewer to do something that isn't value add for the consumer. Yeah. We have seen that. I mean, consumers really are getting quite fussy. There's you fire a can and you'll break the window of three craft breweries. And so trying to create that point of difference, I think how you do it is, is by creating something that consumers can embrace and, yeah. and love and, and fall in love with. Yeah. Well, a couple of things, uh, kind of thoughts I have in this discussion is the difference between a beer in your hand and, and the YouTube is they've already made the purchase so you better keep entertaining them because you yeah. you're not encouraging them to purchase that's done so that that makes a lot of sense that you've already got the customer now let's entertain them so that indirectly so they'll want to come back again but what also strikes me is that you know in this pretty amazing information age that we have going on now with decentralization of lots of stuff and if we think about crypto and identity and all these other things that are becoming much much let's say easier to do in a secure and robust way i i can imagine that there would be a point where a consumer picks up your can scans the code with their phone and if they've agreed they might get something special just for them because yeah. there is a link directly with their phone now the deep dark horrible hole there is that it, somebody facebookizes this yeah. and it's just sucking more of your life out of you when that happens. But what, what I've been seeing in the space, especially with small, medium sized companies is a real effort to play fair and, mm -hmm. and do what the consumer wants, like you're saying, and basically give back and let them participate in the ecosystem instead of trying to just suck the next piece of data out of them so they can monetize it somewhere else. But you, I could literally take one of your beers, maybe scan it with my phone and, you know, I'm going to, Here's something about the park I'm sitting next to and how it's associated with beer versus the mass marketing message about, you know, whatever. So. I love it. You know, social media, I think, is one of the best things that's that has happened to craft beer. Say what you will about other parts of society. What it is for craft beer is, one, it's an affordable way to get your brand out there and allow consumers to connect with you. But most importantly, uh, and I'll use this selfishly, when we have quality challenges, there's a multitude of ways for people to get in touch with us versus when I was a kid growing up, you had to write a letter and say, I got a bad cracker. It was a strange shape or it was burned. I had to write a letter, mail it off. And maybe it, maybe it makes it, maybe it doesn't. In this day and age now, if a consumer has a bad experience, they can be in touch with us in minutes and mm -hmm. we can have a remedy for them in minutes. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Uh, mostly because our experience has been when consumers, they want to be helpful. They want to say, Hey, this beer, supposed to be hazy it's not hazy i just want you to know i think you should know because it's yeah i love the brand and and this didn't meet my expectation and they're genuinely trying to be helpful it's created this really collaborative relationship with consumers mm -hmm. that i love and it also when things do go wrong as they sometimes do beer will re-ferment if you put some wacky fruit juice in and a consumer has a bad experience it allows you very quickly as a brewer 
to start tracking and say, have I got a problem here? Is this a one-off? Is it a handling issue? You know, consumer gets a stale beer at a retail store and the customer says, hey, my beer, I see that by the date code, it's old. I can fix the consumer's problem, but then I can go and I can uh, do a little bit of education with the customer on inventory rotation. I love it. Uh, you know, say what you will about social media. It has made us better and more accountable to consumers. And I love it because it's a, it is 99 times out of 100, it's a really positive interaction. You can make consumers for life by the mm -hmm. way you manage these problems and you can manage the problems super quickly. You just have to make sure that your staff, like we have, we're always on. We have an always on approach to our social media channels, which is makes some people's lives miserable, but uh, is so important. It's critically important. Yeah. To, to well, support. if it all is becoming very collaborative um, and, and people feel like being grabbed around the neck to get the next piece of data for the machine, I, I think one, that's what people are asking for. People have become pretty savvy about that but they are genuinely looking for that authenticity of a brand. Really hard to get that from large global brands. And that's why we, I see a lot in the, this type, in the podcast that we're doing here. That's part of the reason people want local. It's not just because, okay, keep money in the economy locally. That's important, yeah. But you know, people want to feel like they're in a productive part of society. Um, so I, I feel like there's a lot happening there and that what you're what you've already explored is indirectly and directly kind of showing the future of marketing, but not in a way of, you know, again, grab, how do you most efficiently grab the cons consumer by the neck, but how do you welcome them in? And like you said, they're essentially become part of the QA system. Yeah. Which is amazing. And, and they're grateful for it, right? I, I, we don't use canned letters to our, uh, I deal with consumers who are particularly strident in their, challenges with with our product and we don't use canned letters i always reach out and talk to them directly and and it blows them away and it is not to collect uh like you say that's that passive collection of data where now i know where they're calling from you know it's, it's funny there's other apps that consumers have have been surrendering great data mm -hmm. for a long time and rate beer and and untapped untapped in particular consumers are making purchasing decisions based on these review websites. And I know myself as a consumer, I like a lot of reviews, untapped and, and rate beer, more untapped, rate beer is owned by some multinationals, but untapped is a great place I turn to, to just see what other people are saying about beers and, mm -hmm. and log mine. It's, it's a bit like a diary I can have of the beers that I've drank and how I had them, but it creates some, some interesting metrics around what package formats are trending on that platform. You know, are people drinking it out of cans? Are they drinking it out of draft? There's some high level data that, that we can use to steer our businesses mm -hmm. and, and consumers are having a great time. It's gamified. They're having a great time giving you that information and it doesn't feel as sorted as, as how some, uh, some other organizations are collecting their data. Yeah. And that's, there's another great word you use there. I think that we could spend a whole podcast talking through is gamifying this opportunity. But again, with a mindset of how does this become more collaborative versus, if you will, abusive um, to individuals? Tremendous things that um, you're doing with Big Rock, and it's really great to see that. What what are we what are we going to expect to see from Big Rock over the next year or two? Both you know in your product, your growth, technologies that you're using. What's going to be exciting for you in the next two years with your company? I've got a couple things on my list. Most exciting for me, and this is back to what I like about ops, is, is we're looking at wastewater treatment and CO2 capturing. So yeast, mm -hmm. that byproduct of fermentation is yeast. They burp CO2 and they sweat booze. That's essentially how beer is made, is these yeast bathing in some barley water. And we uh, vent a lot of, we vent all that CO2 off into the atmosphere. If you lock it all up in the tank, you'd blow the place up. Literally, the yeast would create too much pressure right. and boom. So we vent it off. And so one of the major, and this will sound bizarre, but one of the major opportunities for us to reduce our carbon footprint is start capturing those yeast burps, scrubbing them because they've got an aroma to them. It isn't necessarily pleasant. Scrub it and then reuse it back in our system to purge air out of mm. tanks and things like that. C CO2 is is a major line item as an expense for us. We buy in the six figures every year carbon dioxide and we're venting off probably as much as we need. We just need to capture it. I love that because it, one, it will improve our bottom line. Two, it'll remove uh, our carbon footprint. It'll improve our mm -hmm. carbon footprint. We've got some win-wins like that that we're working on internally that I 
am very excited about. They sound maybe a little tedious, but I love it. And then in terms of brands, I mean, craft brewers, one thing that's unique about our, our space is that we're into co-opetition, collaborating with your competitors. And so there's some great opportunities for us coming down the pipe, collaborating with other brewers and people outside of, outside of beverage alcohol mm-hmm. and bringing them in and, and creating stories and experiences around that, using our products and our production capability to help tell other people's stories and engage other people's stories with consumers. So we've got some stuff there. We've worked on a, a brand called White Peaks that's a real steeped iced tea that I'm quite passionate about. I like that it, the iced tea category is great. It has some consumer perceptions of health benefits that, Mm. you know, I believe do exist there only because I, I, I'm, I'm a tea drinker and I think that it's good for me. And so we think there's opportunities there to continue to explore that innovation, getting different product categories. Craft brewers used to only be about beer. Now we're pushing into basically Mm. you name it. Right. You know, non-elk, I think, is another major opportunity for a big rock. And now that we've got a pasteurizer, um, we can do it safely, right? Prior to that, um, non-elk, without the benefit of alcohol and without the benefit of some of the pH that goes along with alcohol beer, um, it is challenging to make safe non-elk pot products um, in, a, in a traditional craft brewing environment. And so I think there's a huge amount of opportunity for us in non-elk or low-elk uh, mm-hmm. to connect with consumers because consumers, boy, <laughs> I have never seen fewer, and this will sound good and uh, challenging for brewers. People, uh, underage drinking doesn't exist anymore. Very, very little, which is typically, and I know I was an underage drinker, was typically how um, beer beer drinkers were born as they'd start when they were 16 or 17 drinking in a bush. I grew up in Southern Ontario in a town called Lincoln, and that's how we would start. And then you turned into a beer drinker at a college and and became maybe a lifelong beer drinker in these formative years, consumers are, are really not drinking. They're not drinking underage, and they're not drinking really at university or college anymore. And I think that is, uh, I would look at it as a major opportunity. For the first time in history, the U.S. Uh, has identified that women from legal drinking age, LDA to 25, women are now the number one, uh, not by volume, but by numbers, consumer of beer. It's the first time that women have ever surpassed men in that age group. And they've got some theories on, you know, women in the professional workplace. A lot more women are are going into post-secondary education. And so they're getting exposed to pub life and pre work and all that stuff that was, you know, historically really something driven by men. I think that shift is largely thanks to craft beer. I think craft brewers have done a better job delivering flavor and compelling brand stories to uh, female consumers. W- women are great beer yeah. drinkers because they'll drink based on taste. And I yeah. think that's why more women are coming in. But boy, those men going out the door because they're the volume consumers, a challenge to try and find a way to hook them back in or re-engage them with beer. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, my sort of best beer, craft beer buddy is one of my good friends from Colorado. And she and I, no matter where we are in the world, we're having, we're sending the pictures of the beer back and forth. So I. That, that kind of makes sense to me. I definitely see some of the, the demographics maybe shift, but growing there. So that's great to see. I love it. I think it's fantastic. So it's exciting yeah. times. Excellent. Well, certainly a, a bright future continuing for Big Rock. Um, really successful brand, product company. Great to see people like yourself participating and helping to lead this charge in sustainability and bringing new ideas and technologies on board. Really appreciate you doing that. I appreciate that as a craft beer drinker. Boy, it was a real delight having some time with you today. Thank you. Great. Thanks again. We've got Brad Goddard from Big Rock Brewing here in Calgary again, where hopefully it'll break minus 10 degrees Celsius today and we'll get a little bit warm. (laughs) Fingers crossed. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcasts. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry.